Welcome to ePashala PG courses on computer science. Today we will see about the next module uh, where we will discuss about uh, a concept called RMI. Uh, the objective of this module is to discuss about RMI and how it differs from other technologies. Uh, we will see in this module about the different layers uh, in order to support RMI. Uh, we will also uh, see that how to program with RMI uh, uh, basically using Java. So, RMI actually stands for remote method invocation. Uh, it is one of the uh, remote, pro it is like one of the technology of remote procedure call. So, this Java RMA is a mechanism which would allow the invocation of uh, methods that are available remotely or it is going to be on a different uh, Java virtual machine. So, either this remote object is going to uh, reside in a remote machine or it can be in the same machine, but it can be in a different uh, JVM, which means that it is available in a, it is running in a different address space. So, this RMA provides object oriented remote procedure call mechanism and uh, uh, this supports actually supports JVMs uh, that can reside on different uh, uh, machines and the remote object could be on a different JVM running and, uh, uh, and any method or uh, any procedure can invoke this remote object that resides uh, either locally in the machine, but running in a different address space, uh, which, which means that it is in a different JVM or it can, the method can be running in a different uh, uh, server, which means that it is also running in a different JVM. So, here we can see that the methods uh, can run in a different address space uh, than the calling process. So, the calling process would be running in a JVM or in a uh, address space and the remote object is available in a different address space. So, it can be either in the local machine or it can be in a remote machine. So, RMA is basically a Java mechanism uh, or we can say that Java provides RMA, a remote method invocation mechanism, uh, which is going to be a very easy and flexible way of uh, invoking a remote object that runs in a different address space. So, uh, this Java provides RMI in a different uh, package, core package uh, uh, in the JDK 1.1, uh, which would actually enable the software developers to write distributed applications uh, uh, using which we can invoke the remote objects uh, that are running in a different uh, JVMs. So, we have a separate package that supports this uh, Java RMA in JDK 1.1. Now, uh, let us see about uh, what is this RMA, remote method invocation. So, it is actually an alternative to low level circuits. In the last module, we saw about uh, TCP circuits uh, and UDP circuits by which we have communication, a client server communication between systems. Now, this Java RMA is an another alternative uh, to this low level circuits. Uh, the basic, the idea of this RMI is to have a remote procedure call um, uh, or we can say that uh, we, we need to uh, access uh, a method that is actually running in a different machine or it is available in some other system. So, instead of creating objects on the local machine, we can create some of the objects on other machines, which means that we can create objects on a remote machine and we can communicate with those objects as we are actually doing normally doing with the local objects. So, the idea of RMA is to have remote objects that is running in a different address space if it is, uh, if it is local to the machine or it is going to be a remote objects that is running in a remote machine. So, we will uh, using this RMA mechanism, uh, one would be able to access the objects uh, just like accessing a local object, which means that uh, we try to access a method that is running locally in the machine. So, let us now see about how it differs from the other mechanisms. So, as I told you Java RMA is an object oriented remote procedure call mechanism, but it differs from the uh, another technology an important technology which is a competitive technology to RMA called CORBA. So, this CORBA is, uh, is a language or machine independent. Whereas, when we look at uh, Java, it is language dependent, RMA is language dependent, which, which me, we mean that RMA has to be developed using Java. So, the other competitive technology which is uh, CORBA is a language or machine independent mechanism, uh, 
but this Java was designed for this RMA was designed for uh, Java running on a JVM. And we can see that this Corboy includes more mechanisms like server application starting, managing persistent state, support for transactions and so on. And even this Corba assumes or would make use of an object broker uh, that would actually handle this remote uh, uh, procedure call mechanisms, whereas Java does not have an object broker. And even this Java RMA differs from Sun RPC or T DCE RPC and we can see that this J RMA is not language or machine independent, which, which we mean that it is language dependent. Uh, and machine dependent, but it is not uh, a platform dependent uh, mechanism. So, this RMA supports the concept using Java, RMA supports the concept of classes with methods within a class and RMA also supports polymorphism. So, like Java programming, RMA is uh, uh, basically um, a package uh, in Java which would allow us to make a remote procedure call. So, just like we work with Java classes and methods, we would also be able to work in RMI in Java. So, this actually differs from uh, the CORBA, the basic uh, RPC mechanism, uh, which is a machine independent or a language independent mechanism. And now, uh, we can see the principal similarities between CORBA and RMI. So, uh, we can see that both of these are suitable for distributed uh, applications, de development of distributed applications or we can say that it is both of them are object oriented, both rely on an object oriented mechanism and both supports a distributed client server uh, systems. And we can see that both RMA and CORBA would allow synchronous interaction via remote procedure call. And this RPC is also implemented using stubs and uh, client stubs and server skeletons which would actually hide all the networking and data representation. And the client and the server both of them are treated as objects. So, CORBA and RMI both are uh, similar, there are, there, there are similarities between these two technologies in terms of uh, the application or the basic uh, building block to develop, uh, uh, develop a uh, RPC using CORBA and RMI. But they too have some differences. CORBA and RMA have uh, some differences, uh, let us see what are the differences we have. So, CORB, uh, CORBA we can see that uh, it is independent of the implementation language, but RMA requires all the objects to be programmed in Java. And in CORBA if you take the operation invocations, they can be formed either statically or dynamically, whereas here you can see that in, in RMA operation invocations are formed statically. And Object implementations are binded uh, in a static or dynamic way in CORBA, whereas here all the objects are binded uh, as a static one. So, one, uh, once a client, uh, uh, a remote object is created, it would be bind statically to the registry uh, when we look into a Java RMA. And uh, the object implementation uh, binding could also be static and dynamic in CORBA, whereas uh, those bindings, mappings of names of objects would be static in Java. And we can see that the CORBA would make use of object adapters uh, th that defines the various uh, object execution semantics, whereas here all the object services are, are defined within the enterprise Java beans. And we can also see that in CORBA we have many integrated object services. Uh, but uh, RMA also supports many object services, but they are all written as enterprise Java beans and Java RMA, RMA also supports a mobile code support. And now, uh, the goals of RMA, here RMA supports seamless uh, remote invocations on objects that are running in a different Java virtual machines. And uh, this RMA has to support callbacks from servers to clients. Uh, and uh, the it has to integrate the distributed object model uh, into the Java language. Uh, so, in order to and without spoiling the semantics, without uh, spoiling the semantics and in order to retain the uh, object oriented semantics of the Java language, uh, the distributed object model has been created uh, for RMA in order to support RMA in Java. And uh, the differences between the distributed object model and the local Java object model are very apparent with uh, 
uh, with Java. And then uh, when we write distributed applications using Java RMI, it is very simple and it is also very flexible. And in order to preserve the safety provided by the uh, Java runtime, uh, Java Sun real time uh, environment, uh, this RMI also supports a little bit of security uh, when comes to RMI. So, here we can see that these are the different goals by which uh, they developed the RMI mechanism uh, in order to develop in distributed applications. So, RMI was developed to provide a seamless remote method invocations and it is very simple and flexible in writing an RMI or a remote procedure called code with Java language. And now, uh, coming to the different layers in order to support RMA is given in this diagram. Uh, we can see that there are two uh, machines, one would be acting as a client system, the other would be acting as a server system. Uh, now, uh, we have a remote object that would be running on uh, the other machine. Uh, we can say that it is a different Java virtual machine. This Java different Java virtual machine can be can either reside in a local machine or it can be available in a remote server. So, here uh, you will have a client object in the uh, local machine and you have a remote object that is implemented in the other machine. Now, we need to make use of two, uh, two things called a stub object and a skeleton object. So, the stub would, would be like a handle through which the client would be interacting with the services that is available in the server side. And all the services that are available in the server side for which you will have a skeleton. So, in the client machine, you will have a uh, stub for the client object and in the server machine, you will have a skeleton for the remote object. And there would be a uh, layer called remote reference layer uh, that would be between the stub and the transport layer. Uh, it is available in both the client machine and the server machine. So, you have a remote reference layer and under that you will have a transport layer. This transport layer will make uh, the marshalling of the data, marshalling and uh, uh, marshalling of the data which, which, which I mean that yeah, the all the bytes of data stream bytes would be passed through the transport layer. So, in detail if you look into what is a stub. So, stub is uh, an object which actually provides a gateway for the client. So, through this the client would be interacting with the remote object. So, all the outgoing request from the client would be routed through this stub and the stub would reside at the client side and it would always represent the remote object. So, for every remote object we need to have a stub in the client side that would act as a uh, interface or that would act as a handle to uh, connect to the uh, remote object. So, what happens when the caller invokes a method on the stub object? So, when the caller invokes a method on the stub object, it would initiate the following operations. So, it is listed here one by one. First, the client stub would initiate a connection with the remote virtual machine. So, this remote virtual machine can be in the local machine or it can be in a remote server. So, first it initiates the connection. In the second step, it writes and transmits the parameters to the, uh, the remote JVM. So, we can see that it would do the marshalling process uh, and transmit the information, tries to take the parameters that has to be passed to the remote object. And now, the client stub would be waiting for the result. And once the server completes the process and sends back the results, this client stub would read uh, which mean which we mean here is we will unmarshal the return values or if an exception has happened and it finally returns the results to the caller process. So, this is what the pro steps that would be done by the client stub. And coming to the skeleton, the skeleton is an object that is available in the server side and it would act as a gateway for the server side object. So, all the incoming requests are routed through this skeleton in the server side. So, when the skeleton receives the request, incoming request from the client stub, it actually does some of the process like re read the parameters from the remote for the remote method. So, the some of the parameters to uh, execute with the remote with method would be passed uh, from the client stub to the server stub. So, this server, um, server skeleton, we call it as a, a server skeleton. So, this skeleton would read the parameters for the remote method. Uh, 
and then it invokes the method on the actual remote object available on the server side. And once the remote process gets completed, the data the final result would be uh, written and transmitted, by, transmitted to the caller by this skeleton. So, if you take ja the Java 2 SDK, uh, yes, tab protocol was introduced that eliminates the need for the skeleton. So, we do not need a skeleton, but we need a stub to stub is like a handle that has to be available in the client side. So, without a skeleton we can have an RMI mechanism. Now, uh, once uh, the process of what the client stub would be doing and this server skeleton would be doing, uh, we have a remote reference layer that is lying between the uh, the transport layer and the stub and this reference layer is available in both the client side and the server side. So, this remote reference layer is a middle layer between the stub or skeleton and the transport layer. This is to support uh, varying remote reference or invocation protocols independent of this client stub and the server skeleton. Now, coming to the transport layer, this transport layer is the lower layer that would ship the data. So, we now call the data would be shipped in terms of byte streams. So, where this is what called as marshalling of the data streams. So, this shipping of the ma marshalling streams would happen with the transport layer between the two address spaces. So, this transport layer is responsible for doing certain operations like setting up connections to the remote address space and managing all the connections, managing the connections, then listening to all the incoming calls, then maintaining a table of all the, rem the remote objects that uh, uh, that resides in the same address space and setting up connections for an incoming call, then for locating the dispatcher for the target of the remote call. So, these are some of the responsibilities of the transport layer. So, the connection establishment and the maintaining of what are the uh, remote objects that reside in the uh, same address space and setting up connections for the incoming call or locating the dispatcher for the target of the remote call, everything would be done by the transport layer. Now, so we have seen about the model of how this RMA mechanism is working. So, we, we have understood that a RMA mechanism would work between two me machines. Um, uh, and uh, there, there would be a remote method that would be running in the other end that is in a remote uh, machine or it can be in the local machine, but in a different uh, uh, JVM and uh, the, the one that is going to access this remote object uh, is going to be called as the client uh, and we have seen that there are different layers uh, by which this client and the server uh, are interacting and making this remote uh, method invocation happening. So, in order to write this RMI program, we need to maintain or we need to make use of two classes, two important classes called remote and serializable. Uh, but this re remote is actually an interface, we need to first develop an interface, remote interface by uh, extending this remote interface. So, the, the class that uh, for which you are going to create the remote object would be called as a remote class when it going to implement this remote interface. So, the remote object uh, is a one whose instances can be used remotely. So, we need to uh, have a handle to the remote object that would identify where the object is located and how uh, to contact it remotely uh, through this RMA. But when it is used locally, it works like any other object uh, like a, lo a local object. And when it is passed uh, uh, as a parameter, its handle is passed. So, it is like, uh, like Java objects will pass the parameters of the remote object. So, there is another class called serializable class. So, uh, uh, the serializable is actually an interface and the class the, the one uh, which implements the serializable interface becomes a serializable class. So, a, a serializable object is one whose value can be marshaled, can be uh, sent as byte streams from one end to other end. So, here it can be passed as a parameter or be a return value to a remote object. Uh, so, here the value of the object would be copied and the class would implement an interface called serializable which is available in the IO package. So, you need to make use of java.io uh, import the package java.io in order to make use of the interface called serializable interface.
So, we need to make use of two interfaces called remote interface and serializable interface and the class uh, the, the class the, uh, the one which is going to implement this remote interface or the serializable interface uh, would be called as a remote class or a serializable class. Now, in order to uh, make an object to be serialized, uh, the class has to be declared as a public class. Uh, so, uh, if uh, when a class implements the serializable uh, interface, the class has to be declared as a public class uh, and then the class should, should have a no argument constructor. So, you will have one constructor with, without taking any parameters and all the fields of the class must be serializable which, which we mean that we should not have any transient variables or static variables within this class. So, in order to support this marshalling and unmarshalling, uh, we have to make the class as a serializable class so that you can pass objects as byte streams from one end to other end. So, uh, the class must be serializable either primitive types or uh, primitive types or serializable objects whatever you have should be of serialized should be serializable. And the, uh, then we can see that uh, what is going to be the difference between this remote interface and the serializable interface. So, a remote object lives on a different computer. Uh, here we can say that it is our server computer and we, tr we can send messages to this remote object and get responses back from the object and we need to know that the remote object uh, through its interface. So, and this remote object will not pose much of the security issue, does not worry about all these things, ok. But what happens with the serializable object? So, a class uh, which implements a serializable interface and you try to in, in, uh, instantiate an object for the serializable class. So, that object is now called as a serializable object. So, the, the purpose of the serializable object uh, is to uh, transmit the uh, transmit the information from one end to the other end or messages uh, information from one end to the other end. So, the receiving object need to know how the object is implemented. So, it needs the class as well as the interface and there is a way to transmit the class definition and accepting classes will not pose a security issue. So, here uh, uh, the transmission of data would happen through the serializable object between computers and uh, a remote object is the one which would, uh, would which would reside on a different computer on in a different JVM. And now we will see uh, what are the requirements for developing a distributed application. So, we can call any application as a distributed application if the application has to locate a remote method or it needs to provide communication with the remote objects or the application needs to uh, load the class definitions for the objects. So, in all these cases we can say that uh, the application as a or we can call the application as a rem uh, distributed application. So, this RMA has got all these features, so now it is called as a distributed application. And now uh, let us see about the steps to write the RMA program. There are basically 6 steps to write the RMA program. The first step we have to create the remote interface. So, we will uh, we'll see how to create the remote interface and then uh, the second step we have to give an imp we have to develop an implementation class. Uh, that implements this remote interface. So, first we have to create a remote interface by uh, having an interface that extends the remote interface we will have a remote interface. Once we get a remote interface we will define a class that implements this remote interface that would be the implementation class. And after we have an implementation class we have to compile this implementation class. Uh, once it gets compiled it would uh, generate a stub and a skeleton. So, we will use the RMI compiler which is called as RMIC by which we will be creating a stub and the skeleton. And once the stub and skeleton are created, stub would be available in the client side and the skeleton would be available on the server side. We have to start the next step we have to start the registry service using start RMI registry. So, the tool we will use here is RMI registry in order to start the registry. And then we have to create and start the remote application. So, we will write a server side program and we will write a client program, client side application and we will start the server first and then the uh, we will uh, execute the client next. So, the client would be issuing a request to the uh, remote object that resides in the server and would get back the result. 
So, these are the steps to write the RMI program. Now, we will see the steps one by one. The first step we have to create the remote interface. So, here we, we need to know that we have to first import the package called RMI. So, this is an RMI package that is specifically available within which you have all these uh, remote interface serializ serializable is available in IO. You have another uh, class called unicast remote object all these are available in the RMI package. So, first step you have to import this RMI package and then you have to create an interface remote interface. So, we can see that we create an interface called adder. Uh, that extends the remote interface. Now, this interface adder becomes a remote interface by, uh, by, by which we have extended this remote interface. And this is an interface which will have only the method declaration and will not have any implementation of the methods. So, here we have one method called add and uh, this method would throw an remote exception. So, we declare a remote exception along with this method uh, within this interface. And the second step we have to provide the implementation of the remote interface. So, the implementation can be provided either by implementing uh, by extending the unicast, uh, unicast remote object there is a class called unicast remote object or we can use the export object method of the unicast remote object class. So, here we have actually used the unicast remote object class that is extended with the class called adder remote. So, now uh, we had an interface called adder, we have created an interface called adder. Now, we uh, implement a class called adder remote that is extending this unicast remote object and implementing the interface. So, this class is implementing the created adder interface. So, now it defines the method, uh, the add method within this, uh, within this implementation. So, here the implementation is available. And as I told you this implementation class should have an uh, no argument constructor. So, there is a constructor which would call the base class constructor. The third step we have to compile this uh, implementation class which would generate the stub and the skeleton. So, use the RMIC compiler and give the implementation class name that would generate the stub and the skeleton. Once the stub and skeleton are created we have to uh, now, start the registry. In order to start the registry, you start uh, RMA registry. We have to give the port number where the server has binded the remote uh, method. So, give the port number as 5000 that would be in the server program. And now, we have to create the server application. So, here uh, to create the server application, first we create an object of the, uh, the remote, uh, uh, remote interface object of the class, the class which we have implemented the adder remote is the uh, class. So, you create adder is the interface, we create a reference to the interface which would point to the object of the class adder remote. Now, this server has to bind this remote interface uh, to the registry. So, we use a class called naming class within which we have a method called rebind. So, using this rebind we will be binding this remote uh, method, remote object to the registry. So, the RMA is now here the both the client and server are running in the local machine. So, we here we have given us local host the port number is 5000 and we give a name call add by which the client would identify this uh, remote method and we are uh, associating this re, uh, the reference of the remote interface here. And now we have to create the client application. So, the client would make use of a lookup method to look for the locate the uh, service that is running in the server side. So, we make use of the naming dot lookup same naming class uh, and use a method called lookup to look for the remote method. The remote method is binded with a name called add. So, give the same uh, address and look into the remote method by its name called add. So, we create uh, we call then using the stub we call the add method and you will get back the result. So, here we can see that we start the registry RMI registry running in the port, uh, port number 5000. We compile it RMIC compiler that would generate a stub and a skeleton. Now, we have to start the server start the client we can see the client gets connected to the server and the result is displayed here. So, distributed garbage collection is automatic uh, like uh, Java supports automatic garbage collection for uh, destroying all these remote objects it supports an automatic garbage collection and security uh, 
uh, there is a problem with security with RMA, uh, it does not have any access control, no authentication or no version control with uh, RMA. So, this module uh, we have explained about uh, RMI and we have also seen that how it differs from the other technology called CORBA and we have seen about the RMI layers uh, and we have seen the steps how to write a Java program with an example. These are the references. Thank you.